909 in studio is brought to you by 90.9 the bridge in kansas city to find out how you can become a sustaining member or to donate go to bridge 909.org this is a band that we love dr dog back in the studios uh, you know we we i'm just really impressed that you guys were willing to come back you know it's it's kind of great I appreciate it a great deal yeah i don't know why we wouldn't be willing to come back <laughs> i was just teasing you know uh, uh, so was i <laughs> Well, the last time, the, the new album, by the way, is Critical Equation, and it's fabulous. You guys should be very proud. Uh, you can find out more about the band at drdogmusic.com, and of course, they're playing tonight at the Truman. The last time we had you guys in, you were doing the Psychedelic Swamp Tour, and that was a project that sort of surprised you guys. You got an offer to go back and work on some older material, but it was on a timeline. And so you had another record ready to go. You put it on the shelf. And uh, after that psychedelic swamp tour, you just uh, took the the album uh, abandoned abandoned mansion and just sort of put it out there. No promotion, no press. Made it a benefit for the Southern Poverty Center and and went on vacation. Uh, that that's all sounds a little unusual. It kind of needed to be done. We needed to get off the road for a little bit, and uh, we also wanted that record to get out. And um, we didn't want to tour. And we, it was done, and we didn't have a label anymore or anything, so we just put it out ourselves, and it was pretty pretty painless. You know, we didn't have to do any, we didn't have to promote it or anything or go out and support it or anything like that. Or Yeah. You know, it's it's funny. It's like you hear about bands taking a break six or seven months, and, and sometimes it's like a crisis. We had an artist in earlier this week that said, my body wouldn't do it anymore. But that wasn't really the case with you guys. You just wanted to, to take a break and, and regroup. Yeah, I think we probably would have gotten to that point where the body would just refuse to do its job. But <laughs> fortunately, we were smart enough to get out while we, you know, while we're still sane, sane enough. Yeah, it was more of an existential how the house. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, we would love to hear some of uh, your music if we could. This one's off uh, critical, critical equation. It's called that too. Front, Red. 
title track to the new Dr. Dog record, Critical Equation. And, um, you know, there, there are a lot of questions that I want to ask. Um, but before I, I get to some of that, it's, it's, I want to talk about that song. Uh, Scott, when you wrote that, you really overwrote it. And yeah. it was almost like he created this big block and then chiseled it out to find the statue inside uh, all of the work that you'd done. It actually started off being a funny song. It sort of did, yeah. Yeah, I was just, I was just kind of letting stuff fall out and, you know, not really filtering it or censoring it for a while. And um, Yeah, and after... After a while of doing that, yeah, it, I, I like doing things that way. If you have too much stuff, it, it's easier to edit, and then you can, it does, you know, writing does, sometimes you know what you're going to write about, sometimes you have an agenda, other times it's just the act of doing it that generates your direction, you know, and that yeah. song is probably one of the more extreme examples of that for me, because I just kept writing all these verses, yeah, and depending on the day, I would, I would uh, you know, make jokes in it and stuff like that. But then by the end, it just got whittled down to something more concise. You know, as long as we're talking about Critical Equation, um, you know, I've just been fascinated by this cover. Uh, and one of the things that really interests me is that you have a checkbox that says yes and a checkbox that says no. Dolby noise reduction. Ah. You know, that's, that's the sticker from a Maxell tape. You know, like when you got a blank ah. tape and then... This yeah. all makes sense now. I was wondering what the M and the T stood for in the center. Yeah. Oh, the M and the T in the center is something different, but that, yeah, that strip across the top ah. is just that sticker. Well, so, okay, if it's something different, what is it? Oh, man, it's a lot of things. Um, <laughs> um, well, it's our logo in there. The three dots are in there. Yeah. And uh, one realization that came up in the making of that cover, which is sort of a nod to the Pennsylvania Dutch hex style paintings that are popular in Pennsylvania, where we're from, um, um, yeah, I, I don't know. There's a T and there's an M in there, which obviously inside of a circle elicits trademark, okay. which is some kind of corporate power that we've been trying to, uh, <laughs> you know, convey about where we're coming from. And, um, but also the T and the M have, have history too, because our, our, uh, when we started, we had like nicknames in the band and the only rule with the nicknames was that they had to start with a T and then our actual names all contain an M in them. So it all came together nicely. <laughs> yeah, this is obvious if you stand it yeah, for about two seconds. You know, as simple as this album cover is, I just kept looking at it thinking, well, it's like the dollar bill, where every time you look at it, you see something else. Oh, there's an eye in the pyramid. That's not even know? half of it. The uh, the rings are at, outside. Yeah, everything's got a, uh, sorry, everything's got um, intention behind it. Yeah, it's kind of great. So, um, so the six-month break, you guys come back, and everybody's got... You know this. Um, you know it's it's great to take a break, get a little bit of rest, and everybody comes back and they want to do right by the band as they always have. Um, but you know, Scott, I think you were maybe the one that kind of took the lead in this. Uh, you really kind of wanted to blow the whole thing up. Yes, for some weird reason, it that seemed like the natural conclusion. Like uh, like Tope said, we didn't go into the break necessarily in crisis mode, but just. I think it, I mean, in retrospect, it all kind of makes sense because we'd never stopped in like nearly 15 years, you know. We just never stopped. And I think when there's anything that that's, uh, any, anything that is that prominent a part of your life and you actually never give yourself a second to get your head out of it and then come back to it, um, then you'll just keep going on the inertia of the thing and it's all relative and you're just responding to whatever's right in front of you. But once you stop and you come back, you're, you're kind of, you're um, you're not so much just in the mechanism of it, and I think that it became real obvious that um, there was just room to grow and things to change. So don't put words in your mouth, but the sort of buzzword became simplify. Yeah, uh, keep things simple, keep things honest, make sure that it's who you are that you're representing through your music. Yeah, which is a paradox, you know, because that's kind of I feel like I mean for us I think that's and in the arts in general that's one of the harder things to really commit yourself to, you know? You know, one of the things that I thought was really, like, I'm a big fan of irony. I just love irony. And the, I think that the irony in this story is just how hard it is to be simple. Yeah, um, exactly. You know, and you think about your nature as a band, and Dr. Doug has always sort of loved complexity. 
Uh, and so you had to strip that away. Uh, and then we just talked about the title track where, you know, it, it's you, you overwrote, you know, and then you had to work your way back to the simple thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have a we have a history of overworking. And I think that in part, it's because we love working. You know, sometimes you don't want to give up on working on a song simply because you enjoy the process of doing that, like physically experimenting and being curious and being like well that's cool and all but what if it's like this and there's always a billion things it could be and so um in a positive way sometimes you can overwork it but i think also you can overwork it if you're full of doubt or insecure or if you're less you know from the hip about it and so um yeah we've been just trying to sharpen our intent so that the exercise becomes more about communicating what it is you already think and feel rather than you know, feeling around in the dark until, until you find something. You know, I, I know from following you that Dr. Dog is a band that really cares. And you've been together a long time. And so everything that you've done, you've done thinking, well, this is the best right thing that I can do in the moment. And now you want to blow it up in favor of like a new right. And so do you find yourself doing things that you told yourself were wrong in the past or things that you didn't allow yourself to do? Uh, no, not so much. You know, I think at the end of the day, we probably still appear as our normal old Dr. Dog selves. You know, it's not like we totally threw the baby out with the bathwater. It's all kind of a response to our own our own history and our, our own way of working, you know, so um, yeah, I see it less as this, you know, really aggressive departure from what we are and more just having hit a point where it was like, okay, in order to take the next step forward, the next natural step forward built upon where we've come from, this is what's necessary to take a second and maybe <clears throat> stop taking certain things for granted. Well, it absolutely works. It's an amazing record, and we'd love to hear another song if we could. Cool.
That was absolutely great. I completely got lost in that. I was just standing back oh, there. Cool. <laughs> that was great. You know, um, the liner notes doesn't really list songwriting credits. I'm I'm thinking that I'm safe to assume that this is like the Beatles. If John's doing the lead vocal, he's probably the guy that wrote it. Is that true for the Beatles? That's pretty much true. Every once in a while they trade off, but you can pretty much tell. Yeah. And so I'm that's, assuming that that's, that's yeah, one that's of your songs, Yeah, that's how it works for us, Toby? for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, that six-month, seventh-month break that you guys took, you and Scott both came back with a mountain of songs. That's what I hear. Yeah, he had quite a bit more than me. I've got, ki I've got a kids. I had another. I had a son in between that time, and I already had a daughter, so it's kind of hard to get writing when you're three or three of you home all day long <laughs> yeah. and by the time they get to bed it's like nah <laughs> so he had probably about four times as many songs as i did but yeah i don't know what it is about toddlers not respecting the songwriting oh process. yeah it's, it's brutal just, it's brutal they just you know, can't uh like what are they thinking yeah i just need you to sit quietly for like the next seven hours while i <laughs> stare at a blank piece of paper <laughs> and hold my guitar yeah that it that's that, so hard That'll happen, right? So you uh, you all have these songs, and you come in, and uh, my understanding is that you just spent like a month really getting comfortable playing these things live and working them out. Yes, yeah, we got we we got what we thought were like the definitive live versions of the songs close enough. We knew there was going to be some stuff when we actually got into the studio and started recording with Gus Seifert, who is the guy who produced this record. We knew that some things would change. Um, but we thought we were, we'd go in and we'd maybe bang out a couple songs a day and, uh, it, it didn't really go quite that way. So working with a producer like that, you know, that you really didn't know all that uh -huh. well, it's a totally new thing for you all as a band. Yeah. And we've worked with producers before. Our buddy Nathan has helped us produce Nathan Sabatino. He's helped us produce most of our records and, uh, but we never worked with a producer and gave him utter control and he was the final say for him was pretty much everything and uh that was totally new so i'm assuming that with you know the fact that you were as a band trying to have a fair amount of reinvention that having a boss was both comforting that's what we needed that's what the main thing we needed more than any what we kept saying is when we were working together and it's like well, we kind of tried to start recording and it was like nobody was really in charge we didn't have an engineer so it was just us and everybody knows a little and when something's not going right, it's just like, well, it's somebody's fault. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's just like <laughs> nobody knows. It's everybody's fault, you know? Yeah. So what we, we realized we just needed a boss. We needed somebody in charge that was... So that's comforting. Yeah. But I'm sure it's also completely it terrifying. terrifying. So terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, it was brutal. But it was... Uh, that was by far the... I think that's sort of what you were alluding to earlier about just like totally breaking down the some of the structures that have been in the band for so long it's like we had never done anything like that we've done 12 albums or 13 albums never done that and then we're not the kind of band where it's just like we're going to stop making records so it's like well we can afford to take a massive chance like that and it came out great and it's like learn a lot but some of it was really tough and next time we do something and you know it's just kind of nice that we're we we're at the point as a band where we can do something like that, and yeah. it's not going to, you know, send us in the gutter or something. So did he surprise you, challenge you? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the one, my favorite, my favorite thing is that he's a, a super top-notch bass player. That's his other gig. He plays with Roger Waters. He's like hot shot studio L.A. dude, like recording with everybody and, uh, you know, real high upper echelon. And then just... I hadn't had anybody show me anything on the bass since I was like 13. And so having him just be like, nah, 
just back it off a little bit, play softer. It's that kind of stuff that I, that was yeah. I love that stuff. Yeah. And his, our, our sensibilities were similar, so it was nice. That's great. So uh, then after you, so you really, uh, you, I think it was almost necessary for you to have spent that month because when you go into the studio, you only had two weeks. Yeah, we ended up using, yeah, we were in there for about two weeks, realized that it was, we weren't going to get done. And um, then we went back for, I think, another week and a half. Part of the problem was we were working a tape and so we were running out of tracks. Um, and so we would have to bounce down tracks to get more tracks. So we were mixing as we were recording, which normally you don't do. And normally mixing takes, I mean, it could take a year, but you know, it usually takes at least three, four weeks for us. And with this, we mixed it, Gus just mixed it in like for four days. So you weren't part of that mixing process. No, and that, that was a whole other, little... that was another thing that was crazy. And terrifying. My understanding is, is that he, uh, he would mix something and then you'd get a text message saying, you have half an hour to respond to this. And if you don't like it too bad, it's like, get in now or, or get gone. It was pretty close to that. I mean, there was a little more leeway than that, but it was because he had, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to get too technical, but if you're working from tape and you're working on a board that's old and all that kind of stuff, it all sounds great, but you don't have any of the, you can't save any mixes or anything like that. Yeah. And so you can't just leave it up overnight when you need stuff, when you need to do more mixes. So it's like, you need to respond now. It's only up for a limited, limited time. And yeah, it's nuts. You know, when I was asking that question, Scott, I saw you moving close to the mic because I think that must have been gut wrenching for you too. Um, yeah, well, it was, but it was exactly what we signed up for. You know, mm -hmm. I felt like definitely for what it was we were talking about and what we were doing. Gus really provided an experience that was in line with like, you know, putting your money where your mouth is and and trying to do something differently. And um, um. And actually, it was, yeah, there were challenges, but like Tobe said, there was a lot of things that uh, really broke new ground. It, it was also really exciting to not have to be a part of the mixing process, right. which can be super tedious and real challenging. And, uh, you know, when we tend to record in such a way where the mixing process is just as creative as the initial step into the song, you know, the song might take a wild departure in the mixing process where that is brand new ground for that song at that stage. Um, so to just enter into a different paradigm and be like, okay, we went in there and we played these things again with the intent. It's like, we know what we're trying to do. Did we do it? We did it. Okay. Let's go home and he'll put some reverb on it and make sure that the stuff's loud enough and stuff, but it's not going to become some new piece of music just cause it's getting mixed, you know? Right. So, so was, 16 tracks that helped encourage the simplicity that you were talking about. Yeah, exactly. Well, we would love to hear another uh, piece of music if we can. The new album is Critical Equation. Dr. Dog live in the studio today with us here at the bridge, and uh, they will be playing tonight at the Truman.
Dr. Dog live in the Bridge Studios. That, of course, uh, from their new album, Critical Equation. They're at the Truman tonight. And you can find out more at drdogmusic.com. Uh, Scott, you had an interesting experience with that. It started with an, an organ riff. And, you know, you were just sort of improvising lyrics around that. And Go Out Fighting came out. Mm -hmm. And then after it did, you thought, well, that's not really me. Go Out Fighting sounds so fatalistic. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, that was a weird one, too. Well, it was like, it also points to an interesting thing about just a musical context, because when Zach sent me that riff, and I liked it, and I put it down, like, with some drums and bass and stuff, and then just started singing, I was, I was, I just took this other song I was working on, which was like, it was like, never give up, go out fighting, never give up. Go out fighting, which is the same thing, but seems way less fatalistic than uh, <laughs> the new one. Um, yeah, so it became weird like that. It became real impressionistic. I couldn't quite wrap my head around how to justify that line in this now scary, dire context of that musical backdrop, you know. So then I had to rewrite all the words around that line to, to uh, figure out what I was trying to say with that line. Well, it turned out great. The entire album is spectacular. It's Dr. Dog Critical Equation, and I'm sure it'll be at the merch table tonight at the Truman. It will. Uh, and want to thank all of the members, Scott, Toby, Frank, Zach, Eric. And, uh, you know, I've, I've already said this to you on the in the hallway on the way in, but you guys played Denver last night, and you're playing Indianapolis tomorrow, and that is terrible routing to find time to the squeeze Midwest. into a station and do what you did for us today. It truly deeply matters to us. We love you as a band, and we can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Thanks for saying this. that. That actually does mean something. Thanks for saying that. It's yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's hard. And I also want to thank you for, for dressing up. Everybody's wearing ties. You had, them. Uh, you had ties back there. Yeah, the Just KCPT wardrobe closet. Yeah. You found it. And yeah, so uh, that's, that's lovely. You. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. It's, <laughs> Publicly funded ties. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Dog, uh, always a pleasure. Can't wait for the next time you come and join us. Uh, and we'll see you tonight at the Truman. Dr. Dog live on the bridge. <laughs>